Hi, my name is T. Bui. I'm the author of The Best We Could Do, an illustrated memoir. Um, I'm really excited that this book is part of uh, the NEA Big Reads for 2022 and 23. Um, it's really exciting to have the story live on. Um, and it's wonderful to be part of a, a theme about connecting neighbors because I've always thought of it um, not necessarily as just an immigrant or a refugee story, but as an American story. Um, my family is not special, um, as I say in the intro of the book. Uh, we're very typical of a lot of uh, refugee and immigrant families. And it often takes decades uh, to unravel the knot that is that experience. And so I'm uh, very fortunate to have two parents who let me share our family's story. Um, and I hope that um, communities can use my family's story to delve into the incredible complexities um, that exist within families like ours, the journeys we've gone through and the um, things that we pass down uh, from generation to generation, some of, some of which are pretty hard to talk about. Um, and I hope that our experience can be used to understand many experiences that um, have uh, come to the US and continue to. So one thing I've always wanted to, wanted to be asked about the book, um, but no one has actually ever asked me, is um, on the inside cover of the hardcover, um, in my uh, first bio, I talk about growing up, uh, remembering um, what it's like to kneel on the shag carpet uh, and record mixtapes from the record player. And I grew up listening to Paul Simon and the Beatles. Um, so a lot of people, people have asked about my Vietnamese cultural influences, but the thing is I came here when I was very little and the cultural influences that I had were very mixed. Um, and this to me is identity in the US. Um, so I'd love to be asked about how Paul Simon lyrics have influenced my writing. Um, and I'll give you the answer. Uh, they've influenced them a lot. Um, life as both beauty and sadness together um, and how that exists across the board. Um, and you can see it riding the bus or uh, in your own family. Um, this is what I took away from that music that I grew up listening to on records and recording to mixtapes. Today, we are discussing the best we could do in conjunction with Kyle Kalia Young's book, The Song Poet, and the upcoming opera of the same name, libretto by Kyle Kalia Young, and music by Jocelyn Hagen, both of whom will be part of today's discussion. Um, being presented by the Minnesota Opera this coming March 9th through 19th, 2023. Joining us to host today's event and discussion is our colleague and friend, Lee Bynum, who currently serves as Vice President of Impact at Minnesota Opera and as an ACF board member. So please join me in welcoming Lee. Good afternoon, I'm Lee Bynum. I am the Vice President for Impact at Minnesota Opera, where I administer the company's educative engagement and equity programs. It's a pleasure to be here today. Since moving to Minnesota two and a half years ago, one of the projects that's been nearest and dearest to my heart has been the opportunity to shepherd from page to stage Kao Kalia Yang's beautiful family memoir, The Song Poet. The Song Poet chronicles her family's immigration from Laos to the United States in the 80s, and it pays special attention to her father as a thinker and an artist and a passionate person who shaped her and her sister's lives and experiences here. I would love to introduce Kalia right now and have her share a little bit about the story. You should know that in addition to being a brilliant author and in-demand speaker, she's also an important voice who chronicles the experiences that are fundamental to America, sharing pieces of families, immigrants, and women who have stories that have not received the attention that they deserve to on the stage and on the page here. Please welcome Kalia. Thank you, Lee, for that beautiful introduction. Thank you all for being here. 
It is now an honor for me to read a little bit from the original text, The Song Poet for all of you. Dedication. For the suns that rise on the horizons we've yet to see, for my brothers and sisters, my sons and daughters, for my father Mi Ya, who sings his lonely songs, so that we may hear the trembling of the still fluttering heart. It opens with an epigraph. Guzia is, in the words of Ralph Ellison on the American blues, an impulse to keep the painful details and episodes of a brutal experience alive in one's aching consciousness, to finger its jagged grain and to transcend it, not by the consolation of philosophy, but by squeezing from it a near tragic, near cosmic lyricism. As a form, the blues is an autobiographical chronicle of personal catastrophe expressed lyrically. Gutierrez's songs can be duets, the voices of fathers and daughters coming together, different verses within the same song, stanzas in the same poem. From the album notes. My father would never describe himself as a poet. In Laos, he was a fatherless boy. In Thailand, he was a refugee waiting in the dust. In America, he is a machinist. Through it all, he has been a poor person yearning for a father and living to be one. My father is Ju Mo's husband and the father of seven children, five girls and two boys. My father says that on his gravestone, he wants it known that his wife and his children are his life's work. He would love it if we could add, all of Mi Ya's children became good people. I am the only person I know who describes my father's work as poetry. I'm not referring to the pieces of hard metal he polishes, the rough edges he makes smooth, the coarseness he evens into shine. I'm talking about the songs he composes day and night in Hmong, our language, his guzhia. My father is not a writer. He does not write down his compositions. He is a singer. He sings them. It has taken me a long time to gain the courage to call my father's work poetry. For much of my life, I've described my father to the world as a machinist, not as the poet I know him to be. I didn't have a way of conveying how being my father's daughter has taught me not how machines work, but how the human heart operates. I grew up hearing my father digging into words for images that would stretch the limits of life for my siblings and me. In my father's mouth, bitter, rigid words become sweet and elastic like toffee. His poetry shields us from the poverty of our lives. On the colorful woven plastic mat in the middle of our living room, we sit around my father. We look at the walls with him. The mold growing wild becomes the backdrop of the beautiful paintings we see on television. The peak of this mountain, the descent of that river, the sliver of tree that clings to life on the edges of the rocks, open and exposed. We point at the things we did not see before our father's words gave them shape, alternatives, possibilities. My brother Tzu sees a crane at the river's edge. Shi Lu points to the sky with its cloud families gray and rumbling and whispers of bad weather approaching. For a moment, we are living in a priceless, ageless piece of art. In the deep of winter, after months of unseasoned cold, my father points outside our front window at the ice-covered mounds of snow shining in the bright sun under a cloudless sky of blue and says, look at the garden of winter. The snow flowers are blooming today. My siblings and I leave our places by the big heater with its opening single blue flame. And we look out into a picture of winter we thought we had grown sick of. We blink against the shine. Beneath our lashes in the sliver of open eyes, stars twinkle in the colors of the winter rainbow. The children marvel while my older sister Da and I take deep breaths and breathe foggy air onto the glass pane. We draw the flowers of early spring in the cold, wet glass with our fingers, buds of tulip and daffodils, the burst of dandelions, 
fragrant lilac blooms. The sweet, clean scent of magnolia blossoms and the images of the flowering trees stocked with soft white, pink, pinkish red, and purplish white petals remind us that warm weather and abundant flowers are coming our way. The world of winter becomes bearable in the promise of spring. In perfect pentatonic pitch, my father sings his songs, grows them into long stretching stanzas of four or five, structures them in couplets, repeats patterns of words, and changes the last word of each verse so that it rhymes with the end of the next. He is a master of parallelism. The language is protracted and the notes are drawn deep and long. The only way I know how to describe it as a form in English is to say, my father raps, jazzes, and sings the blues when he dwells in the landscape of traditional Hmong song poetry. Different shapes come forth from the dirty places. Different possibilities are born in the shadows of our lives and windows emerge in the places my brothers and sisters and I have only ever seen walls. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now I believe I have the pleasure of introducing a small clip of my father singing and the artistic, little bit of the artistic process that Jocelyn Hagen, our incredible composer, will speak more to. Tiko pono ku tiku toko nu toko e chi jong li ku nu no em ku pon bi kia lo to no le tu mi nyu tu tu yo tu mi phong yu yon bi lo che I have the honor of introducing all of you to Jocelyn Hagen. I know Jocelyn to be a compassionate person, a wonderful listener, an incredible student, a composer, a pianist, oh, one of the most gifted singers I've ever met and had the, and I've had the honor of working with, um, Jocelyn, my good friend and the composer for the Song Poet Opera. Hello, I'm Jocelyn and I'm a composer and I live here in Minnesota. Most of my schooling was here. I was actually born in Minneapolis as well. I went to St. Olaf College and the University of Minnesota. And I am a composer who has written a lot of vocal music. As a singer and a pianist, it, it came really natural to me. And as you might know, Minnesota is a really wonderful place for vocal music. And as a composer who writes a lot of vocal music, I spend a lot of time with words. So I've set a lot of poetry to music. I've set letters. I've set other kinds of strange things um, and lots and lots of poems. But you can imagine my thrill when I was asked to do this project with Minnesota Opera and set words written by Kao Kalia Yang. Uh, that was just a really amazing um, question to be asked. And so I was thrilled to take it on. My creative process for this piece started much the same as with any other work where I spent a lot of time with the words at the beginning, you know, just reading them, um, trying to understand exactly what they meant, what emotions were inside them. But I also, this, this project was really different also because of B. Yang and his poetry, his, his singing. So I spent months just listening to him sing and internalizing as much as I could. And so this little clip that you heard just a few minutes ago was one of the little voice memos I received on my phone of B. Yang singing part of the libretto of the song poet. So I think it's really important to always talk about in terms of this piece that I am just one of the composers of the song poet. B. Yang is the other composer of this work, and he set many, many lines of text that I then transcribed and uh, for, for the singers to sing. So we're going to listen to that clip again, 
And you will see now part of my process, which is taking that beautiful music and putting it and notating it into music so that the singers can sing it. Si ko porno ku zi ku ta ko nu ta ko e chi song li ku nu no em ku pa mi kia lo ta no le tu mi nhua tu tu yo u tu mi phong yu yo mi lo chi yo. The song poet and the best we could do share many themes. Perhaps most notably, each addresses generational difference in honoring our parents. Could you talk a little bit about how you approach this in creating the opera? I love, you know, I love T's book, The Best We Could Do. Not, al not only is it a refugee memoir, it's also a Southeast Asian refugee memoir, and there are just simply not many stories. Of course, he's a beautiful artist, so she's able to put visually on the, on the page what my heart only yearns to do. Um, but the themes of his book are really much the themes of my life as well. You know, I was a refugee kid, came here at the age of six, was born in a refugee camp. All I knew for the first six years of my life was everything within that 400 acres, where we waited with 40, 50,000 others for the possibility of a life somewhere else. In this place, there weren't many elders, so many had died in the war. And so there was my grandmother, the only grandmother I knew, my paternal grandmother, Zhuo Li. And she becomes, of course, for me in my book, very much as his parents are for her and hers, this figure. Every time the phone rang in America, my grandma, the coolest, she would, you know, pick up, say hello, wait for like 30 seconds because she's polite. And then she would say no and hang up. In a world where everybody was struggling to become what America wanted, my grandma was not interested, understood life beyond America, beyond Thailand. Perhaps even then when I knew her in her 80s and 90s, life beyond the moment, the world that we inhabited. And so very much the theme of honoring our elders, meaning up with these cultural, these traditions and guides, and that's very much a story of my life as well. So I'm so honored that we could do this program, talk about the song poet, honoring T's work the best we could do. Thank you. And I think maybe we'll just pull on that thread a little bit and talk about the music as well. Part of what is so compelling about the best we could do is how T manages to capture something beyond just the words, right? In, in the images that she creates, she's able to touch upon a lot of nuances that maybe the words aren't able to do. And being able to sit with the score for the last two and a half years, Jocelyn, I think you've done something very, very similar with the music. Could you talk about what opportunities musicalizing the story presented? Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say that in terms of this story, they, I, I didn't, there are definite parallels that I can find in ways to relate to this story, although it's, it's not my story, right? And so, so much of my job and this work really was a service. Uh, my work is a service to this story and to Kalia and to this community. And uh, so I really cared so much about getting it right and getting the right emotions um, for all those scenes, all the different things that happened to these um, to these people. And you talked about, you know, the waiting across and that's that's a really amazing moment in in the opera. And it was it was fun and exciting and crazy to write that music and imagine what that was actually like. Um, one of my favorite musical moments in the whole thing is when Chu is um, pregnant and singing to her unborn daughter. And in opera, we think, oh, the, the orchestra, that's what always is um, is accompanying you, right? And in this case, yes, there are strings playing underneath that song, but there's also the sound of bombs. And so I, I thought that was a really important thing to bring into the sound world of the opera because Laos was the most heavily bombed nation in the world and the world didn't know it. 
And can we continue talking about the, the actual sonic palette? Because it's really compelling to me that not only do we experience people singing, but we get the winds, the mountains, and the machines. Can you talk about how that choice also um, works to create something very unique in the universe? You know, for me, when the, the Minnesota Opera bought the rights to adapting the book, they didn't buy the book. And so I was tasked with reimagining what it could look like. And the original idea was to present this as a youth opera. You know, but I've always wondered as a child and then as an adult, what would those mountains have to say to a bigger world if they could speak, if they could be heard? Those mountains in Laos, tall mountains, disfigured mountains, mountains somehow still standing. I thought, of course, immediately about those dogs. Refugees cannot take pets. They cannot take pets when they're resettled. And we had two dogs. And I remember how they chased that bus, even past the men with guns, until the smoke of the bus was such that I could no longer see them. I wanted to talk to those dogs. I wanted to feature that moment. It is not something that we talk about very much. We say refugees come to this country with very little. And sometimes, so often we think about things, but all of those lives left behind. Because I spent most of my childhood wondering what happened to those dogs, to the lion dog and the Jackie Chan dog. And then the machines. My father spent most of his life in America as a machinist with a supervisor yelling always, harder, faster, smarter. And my dad and all of his coworkers knowing that there was no intelligence in running those heavy machines, just alertness all the time. I wanted those machines to be able to talk. You know, one of the most painful things that happened to my dad, one time he tried to talk to a supervisor and the supervisor said, B, you are here to talk to the machines, not to me. What would those machines say if they could talk back, having heard so much across the years? So it was, a, for me, an incredibly radical and creative way to get at the story from these different threads of our lives, these pieces that I carry even today. After reading your book and in the libretto and trying to imagine what all these what all this sounds like, because that's what I do. I, I imagine what what places, what people, what emotions sound like. And the jungle, your home, it's a very magical sound to me. Uh, there's there's a lot of harp and marimba and pizzicato strings. It just has this very warm but kind of glittery and magical sound to it. At least that's that's how I interpreted uh, it and how my mind interpreted those emotions in that place. And then there is the transfer. You come to America and there's this scene in, in the factory with the machines. And so I knew I wanted it to sound really, really different. So I actually hired a friend of mine who's an electronic musician to create a synthesizer for me that was the sounds of machines and factories. And it's this rhythmic kind of clanking and, you know, so it's very different from the magical, whimsical, beautiful jungle. It's instead, you know, industry and metal and a very different sound. I, and I loved that juxtaposition, those two different sound worlds. Um, and I'll just add that that jungle moment that Jocelyn is alluding to is, is perhaps most, the most fanciful moment for me. It is a moment in which I can imagine my mom and dad meeting each other in the middle of this war, having been abandoned by the U.S. and other countries, knowing that there is like a contingent of some 10,000 North Vietnamese army tr soldiers looking for them, where there is a jungle ballroom and they meet these young people and they smile at each other. And she thinks he has perfect teeth. You know, and so they, they pass by, but their spirits linger and they dance their way into love and they dance their way into the life I would know them, I would share with them. Um, so I've had the pleasure of getting to work with a couple of different composers and librettists as they've created operas before. And I'm always really fascinated by the the sort of um, economy of words that we really have to use when we approach opera. Um, how did you think about going from the really expansive story that you told in the memoir to the scenes that 
created the same or the similar story for the opera? And did you have to recontour your family's history in order to make that work? Oh, I love that question, Lee. As a writer, I know that the more room you have, the more room there is to make mistakes. Um, you know, at the same time, it is, it is this careful balance, right? The more room you have, if your readers are going to stay with you, the tighter those relationships can be. And so I really had to, to work within this parameter, and I think that's really the birthplace of creativity. It is definitely the story of my life. How does a first generation you know, refugee girl become a writer, right? There are all these parameters that are set and I must navigate within them. In many ways, I got to mirror on a slower and a smaller level the story of my life. How do we do this and how do we do this well? Which are the pertinent scenes that will honor the different individuals? I think if there is anything that would be said one day of the work of Ngokaliya, it is that everything I write is a love letter to someone somewhere. And that's exactly how I thought of it my love letter to the mountains, the mountains that I know will continue standing long after I'm gone. You know, those dogs that we had to leave behind, but they have, they've never left me. My father and the machines, the factories, my mother and that baby who would become my older sister, the strongest person I know, not because of her strength, but because of her infinite softness. And so it was a way of honoring these different people. And I know, Lee, at the heart of it, I know that there will be other things beyond this opera, different ways in which I can honor the rest. And so that gives my heart a kind of freedom to approach uh, the form of the opera and to do this work that I know is going to push the edge of the form and yet also pay homage. When, when we think about um, the kinds of of themes that are really prevalent right now um, in literature, but also just in the world, and look at the best we could do and the song poet and also the late Homecomer, another work of yours, relative to a couple of other recent works. Eric Wynn's Things We Lost to the Water, Melinda Lowe's Last Night on the Telegraph Club, and Eva Chen's I Am Golden. Could we talk about why this is a critical time for immigration narratives? You know, we live in a world that is creating more and more refugees all the time not less, more. And I think it's important for me to state here that Minnesota is home to more refugees per capita than any other in the nation. And yet when we talk about these titles, we're talking about the coast predominantly, right? We're not situating in the Midwest, um, part of the country that so many still think of as flyover territory. You know, when I go outside of Minnesota, and I do frequently for my work, everybody is shocked when I am the writer from Minnesota. This is the land of Garrison Keillor. This is, you, you, you know, um, not, not somebody who looks like me, who sounds like me, who meets the language the way I do. Um, and so always, I think I'm playing with people's expectations, not only of me as a writer, but me and the things I write about, the times that we are living in. The Midwest is a complicated place. Minnesota worse, pretty much, on all racial equity measures, and yet now home to the biggest Muslim mosque in the nation. There are all of these forces contending with, and I think these forces are so representative of our world right now. Though the song poet came out in 2016, just you know, right after the election of Donald Trump. My newest book, Somewhere in the Unknown World, a collective refugee memoir, um, comes out in 2020, right after the election of President Joe Biden. There are these, I will say this, books suffer the same fates as nations. And the things that we write about as, as writers, I think, are the themes of our lives, the place and the time that we inhabit. Because I imagine that somewhere down the road there will be among, and so we believe very much in this ancestral world, where I would be an ancestor. And one of my descendants will look back and they will say, I want them to be able to say, this is when my grandmother, my great grandmother lived. This is the world that made her. And for everything that was happening, wasn't she, didn't she love this world and see its beauty? And I think always in all of these work that, works that you're referencing, we're all talking, looking for beauty in a world that is so often harsh and cruel. A world that touches us, a world in which we will touch it back. There's always that 
Newton, right? For every force, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So beauty and cruelty, I, I think maybe that's a, a little something I'd like to think about. Um, one of my favorite things about um, The Best We Could Do is how T manages to capture this palpable and well-learned ambivalence about both the United States and Vietnam, right? Um, she doesn't romanticize, she doesn't vilify, she's just honest. She's very, very honest. And I think there is something about that honesty that is really resonant for those of us who are either the children of immigrants or have been immigrants ourselves. Was this something that you wrestled with in creating the opera? Would you like to respond, Jocelyn? Oh, well, I, 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 I feel like you should keep going and respond to that. I, I mean, it, it's, it, again, it's not my, my ancestors came over a long time from Scandinavia. <laughs> Surprise, right? Minnesota. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, th I think about that and I, and I think about the culture we've created. And you talked about Minnesota before. And the reason why I brought that up when I introduced you know, when I started talking is because I'm really proud to be from Minnesota. And uh, I and I love that we have so many refugees here. And I love that Minnesota Opera decided to make this a project with Minnesota artists. You know, I think they could have hired a composer from New York or anywhere else, but they instead they hired me, uh, a Minnesotan. And I think that that's really something to celebrate as well. So that's not really answering the question, but why don't you keep keep going? You know, part of the work, I think, of being an immigrant writer or a refugee writer like myself is always reminding and saying so much in the stories that we tell. Unless you're Native American, you came from somewhere to call this place home to. And it wasn't so many generations ago that your elders spoke with the same accents um, that live in our homes. One of the, I think, most compelling parts for me as a writer is understanding and as an artist is understanding that the work of the artist is not to seek agreement or disagreement in the world. And I think that is certainly true of the best we could do. It is to deepen a bigger understanding. You know, in the song poet, I wrote about my brother Tzu, who drops out of high school because there is no room there for him. And that was made apparent in 10,000 ways. And when I asked him, I said, Sue, how do you, I've, I've written this. Do you want to read it? Are you comfortable with it? And he read it and he was quiet for a, a very long time. And when I said, Sue, what do you think? And he said to me, I am so tired of being judged for the things I'm not. Let the world see me for who I am. And I think that is exactly the truth. Let the world see me for who I am, see us for who we are. Because when people meet my mom in a store, they don't see the strength and the beauty and the wisdom that I know lives there. They see this short refugee woman with really red hands, painful hands, hair pulled back, wrinkles, because she has been pushed down by gravity and other forces. Her shoulders tired and exhausted. And so always I am looking to present what is true of my home for the world. And I don't care whether you agree or disagree. It is your deeper understanding that I'm looking for. It is the pulse of your humanity that I'm looking to feel as an artist and as a writer. And I think that is certainly the reason why this, the best we could do is so beautiful and in, in many ways so accurate. It is the reason why so many immigrant and refugee artists do the kinds of work that we do. Because we're tired of being read, being understood for the things that we are not. Meet me. Judge me from the inside out. I, I love that point. And I, I think about uh, the best we could do as offering correctives yeah. in a couple of places, right? Um, different framings of things historically, um, and then in some places actually pushing back at the narrative around what the conflict in Vietnam was. Can we talk a little bit about how the weight of representation showed up in your process, right? And um, and part of what I want us to think about too, um, Jocelyn, what it is to be a woman composer in a very old art form that 
we still pretend as if women don't compose music, right? Mm -hmm. So what was that for your collective process? Yeah, I, I think this was one of my best ways in is the fact that uh, composing is still a very much male dominated profession. And I've had to fight my way a little bit to create a space for myself. And so I know a little bit about what that's like, um, obviously not to the same extent, but I there there was a connection there. And um, yeah, I, I sorry, <laughs> my, my brain started going in a different place. But um, I, I'm so grateful that Minnesota Opera has been working so hard to make sure that the cast represents what the, the people that are a real part of this story. And as much as I, I love this story and I want lots of people to be able to perform it, it'll be interesting to see how it lives on because I would love for it to live on with always the correct representation on the stage. And, and we'll just have to wait and see how that goes. This is still very new in the opera world that we're being so, um, what's the word I'm looking for? so cognizant, so so devoted to this idea. So that's a really wonderful way that opera is moving forward. You know, Lee, at this point in my career, and I've been doing this now for nearly 20 years, you know, I, I became a writer because of a grandmother who could not read or write. That one grandmother I knew, Joa Lee, who all of my life with her signed her name with a shaky X that stood in. My grandma's biggest fear was that she would be forgotten, and I became a writer so that she would be remembered. It was a project of the heart. My whole trajectory as a writer is a project of the heart. And I think that is the most shocking thing about that. You know, when people come to my events, when they read my books, the number one comment is, you're not what I expected. Then of course, it always begs the question, what were you expecting? When you met me, when you enter into the pages of my stories, what were you expecting? Um, but I know people always mean it as a compliment, and I also pay heed to that. Uh, but, but I know that there is a lot of work to be done. The thing that I represent every time I go into the pages, I represent the fact that all of us, that we extend far beyond the edges and the parameters that hold us in. It isn't just the skin that I feel, it is this room that I feel. It is this building and the space and this place that I feel is the biggest possibility of my humanity that I'm reaching for as an artist every single time. And, and so that frees me up in a very real way from the responsibilities of representation. If I know I'm playing for the right side and I know where my allegiances are, I have to give myself the freedom to grow and to make mistakes, necessary mistakes. All of those white men who do creative nonfiction on those shelves, they've made those mistakes. And it takes a certain amount of failure to get at success. And I, I imagine that there will be one day a body of work that represents the growth of Ngokalia Ya as a thinker, a scholar, and a writer. The flowering of my heart as an artist all along the way. I'm 40, I'm gonna be 42 next month by year's end. You know, so, so I'm at this halfway point on the life spectrum. But in terms of my career, you know, I've been at this for 20 years. I imagine there will also be 20 more years I don't know where I'm going to go, but I don't want to limit that going. And so I always look back to that grandmother, Joali, whose fear was that she would be forgotten in a world that values so very much what is written. That her granddaughter and Gogalia Ya will work in this form to honor the richness and the truth of her life and her journey. I think back to that, and I'm good. I'm not representing all of the world. Her steady hands are holding me up, although she's been gone now for nearly 20 years. And I can feel that. And so I'm good on this responsibility question. Even when I'm tired, her hands are holding me up. And I know she won't let me fall. We would be lucky to get 20 more years of your words and your perspectives. Um, I think we may have to pause here for questions from the audience, but I'm so grateful to hear from both of you today. It only makes you more excited about the piece coming up. Thank you for your superb, superbly thoughtful questions. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Yes. Oh, okay. oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. 
So a question uh, for each of you. You noted that writing for The Voice was uh, natural for you. It felt organic. I wonder if you could speak to uh, how uh, the process was for you writing for the orchestra and writing some of the uh, the other sounds. And then for you, I, I wonder um, what this process, well, how this process has impacted your relationship with opera, with uh, the Western classical arts in general. Well, to, to answer your first question, uh, because I'm a singer and my mother told me that she always knew when I was happy as a child because I was singing. So I, the fact that I grew up to be a composer was, was no shock um, because that was just how, the way I expressed myself. Um, and as a pianist, I was also kind of limited to that, that color or that, you know, that was my, that was my sound world for a very long time. I'm also from rural North Dakota. Um, I was born here, but then I grew up in North Dakota and there are no orchestras in rural North Dakota. And I had limited access to all that. But in school, I learned about all the instruments and even had to play a little bit of each of them. Man, I can't play the flute. That's a hard instrument. Um, but when it comes to orchestrating, so much of it becomes about color. And so like when I was talking about that magic before and the color of the harp and how that just, it has a magic to it that I can't, I can't describe. Um, and then pairing that with marimba and especially with like a low pluck of a cello, like that, that sound to me has a very distinct emotion and feeling attached to it. There, there are some people that have synesthesia, which assigns actual colors to <laughs> to music and I find that extremely fascinating as well but that's that's kind of what I'm imagining is I'm 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 painting with sound I love that painting a sound mm -hmm. you know so so I grew up poor on the east side of St. Paul um, I had no experience of the opera growing up once in a while we would get five dollar tickets to the Guthrie and our English teacher at Harding High School on the east side of St. Paul used to give us extra credits whenever any of us could go to, to, to the Guthrie. And my mom, my mom and dad didn't have much money. They were both assemblers in the night shift, but she would find the, you know, the change that we needed to get those tickets to get us to, to, to the Guthrie once or twice a year. Um, when I went to graduate school in New York City, there were of course opportunities to get student tickets to like the Met. So I went several times, but truth be told, somewhere in that production, I fell asleep. And it was usually the best sleep I'd gotten. You know, embarrassed to tell the world, but that is the truth. It's beautiful to fall asleep to that kind of magic. Um, but but when, when Jamie Andrews, who's no longer with Minnesota Opera, but I think Jamie was really the one who saw the pairing. Um, when Jamie Andrews connected with me and contacted me, I was super excited. It was. I didn't think then that I would be the librettist. You know, they had a librettist in mind for the project. Um, when that did not work out and, and the opportunity presented itself, I was, I was scared. I didn't know much about the form, hadn't been exposed. Could I do it? But I am answering a person of color, so I will be very honest. The reality is that so many of us, we never think of our, about what we can do in certain spaces because we've never been welcomed into those spaces. We've never gotten the opportunities. No institution has said, Kalia Yang, I trust you to learn about this and to do it. And that was too valuable of an opportunity to give up. I know that this, I know that this opera will open up a lot of doors for artists, for singers from around the country, from around the world. I know that it will open doors for other writers coming into the space. And that, that was too important for me to say no to. And so I said, Jamie, can I come to your shows? Can I see it in different space stages? I want to see, I want to dissect this form a little bit and then let's see what I could do to it. But I think that speaks to the kind of individual I am. It is very hard for me to back away from a challenge. Not athletic at all, but very fast internally. My heart has wings. Um, and so I let this winged heart fly away into the space. Am I nervous that the show is already sold out and it's coming in March and lots of people who really know the world of opera are gonna come see it? Definitely. But am I also excited that they will see a newcomer come into the space to see what I've done in terms of the writing of, 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 the, of the words? Definitely. The faith 
is stronger than the fear. Thanks. Um, thank you all for a great conversation so far. I'm curious, I guess this question is mostly for you, Jocelyn, as a poser. Um, you showed your the notation or a bit of it earlier. Um, I'm wondering how uh, you thought about the nuances and, and the transcribing of that. And I think you spoke to it a little bit, but maybe wondering more about how that transcription process happened for you, how the um, nuances in the, of the voice uh, maybe came into it or, or not, and how that works with communicating this to the the choir or the singers. I'm wondering if that any of that process of um, yeah, of musical traditions, musical approaches, cultural differences, and how that comes into play? That's a wonderful question, because it was extremely challenging. <laughs> it's one of the hardest things I've had to do, not only because it was just a new language that sounded very different to me, but also the how the words are spelled also kind of made no sense to me like that that took me a long time to try to internalize and even still after months of practicing i don't feel like i ever really got it all the way right which was why b yang was brought in and i'm so grateful that that's how it ended up it was so the right solution to the problem because then he sang the words and we have his we have the recordings of them, so we're able to pass those on directly to the performers. Because there is something lost in notation. You know, all those slide, like all those little things, you know, I can put a little gliss notation in there, but the nuance of, ex of exactly the way he does it, it can really only be taught by hearing it, I think. So um, I'm so grateful that we have those for posterity, that we're going to be able... So you buy the score and you get those sound files right along with it. I think we have time for one more question. A quick question. Since I heard it was sold out, is there any chance that you're <laughs> going to expand the scheduling? Because I haven't signed up for tickets yet. And we both look toward Lee immediately. <laughs> and I'm also looking toward someone. Um, I certainly hope that there, the response is such that Minnesota will bring it back in a future season. Um, we haven't had an experience with the show selling out this far in advance completely before, but I think that's a, a testament to the hunger for new stories, the the belief in the work of the two creators and the the multiplicity of cultures here in the Twin Cities that really come together in, in this way that we can start telling new stories that aren't the traditional Western European, you know, royal court sort of operas that we're used to. So I'm, I'm excited by what this represents and I'm really looking forward to um, something that pushes my colleagues towards thinking more broadly about what we're producing. Thank you all so much for your questions. I'm going to hop up on the stage here as well. Uh, my name is Elisa Peterson, and I am the Director of Development for American Composers Forum. Thank you three so much for being here today and sharing so much of this wonderful conversation and your stories and your experience. If you enjoyed this event, we hope that you will come to some more of the events that we're having in this series. So our next event is going to be happening the first week of February, and it's going to be focused on Latin American immigrant communities in Minnesota. We'll feature several Latin American composers as well, as well as some ACF composer awardees. And they'll be in conversation about documenting the shift in experiences through generations. We'll also have two more events coming this spring in March and in May. So please stay tuned for more details about those. And the entire series is going to culminate next September with ACF's 2023 Artist Equity Summit, where we'll talk about all of these themes that we've been addressing throughout the entire series about immigration, identity, and the arts. So please stay tuned. If you haven't signed up for uh, ACF's email list or Eastside Freedom Library's email list, please do so so you can get more information and hopefully join us for future events. And uh, to finish us off, Kalia, I think we have one more video that you were going to introduce for us. One more video, yes. Um, so because this was first envisioned as a youth opera, um, Mitra Sagdipur uh, was working with these young singers and training them for the libretto. 
and we have a clip from that. It is a song entitled Sisters Are Life Partners Too. We have two very young and very nervous performers singing in chorus in the depths of our pandemic, our pandemic. I think ownership is critical here. And so we get, you, you all get to hear them sing it. It's kind of like the double world premiere before a live audience of these two talented, nervous, young, flowering singers. Thank you. This is a world premiere of the, op the, the duet Sisters Are Life Partners too from the opera The Song Poet with words by Kalkalia Yang and music by Jocelyn Hagen and Dee Yang. Here we go. <laughs> took a second mortgage on their house so we can get the line of credit for this office. I can't believe it. What is there to believe? You deserve the best. Our life in America is like a ladder. I'm the first step so you can be the second. I went to Hamlin so you can go further. I became a lawyer so you can become a writer. If the only accomplishment is the completion of your book, then this is worth it. I wish I believed in myself the way you believe in me. Remember when I came home from going to my first play and pounded on the bathroom door and yelled, Kalia, acting happens in real life, not just on TV. Remember when you ate with their first silver spoon and came home and went into mom's special suitcase and pulled out a silver coin and put it on my tongue so I wouldn't be rooted out by the taste of silver? Remember when you all left me at college with a cardboard box in my hands and later in my room, I opened up a laptop that had taken all of mom and dad's savings to buy? <laughs> I remember when you were first born and dad said to me that when all is said and done and the lovers friends have come and gone, we will share more of each other's lives than with anyone else. Sisters are life partners too. Bigger. 